This goes out to my extraordinary nursing students. You have no idea how much I wish for you to succeed. I have been attempting to upload chapter eight lecture for approximately three hours. And I've recorded it five times. It won't upload. I don't know if the powers that be don't want y'all to have this uh this lecture or what, but baby, we're gonna get this lecture. We're gonna do it. Okay, this lecture is about communication and the nurse patient relationship. So the process of communication um, takes place with communication for one, and it occurs when one person sends a message and another person receives the message. Um, and is able to process the message. It indicates that the message has been interpreted correctly. It is a continuous circular process. It can be either verbal or nonverbal, okay? Interviewing skills should be handled as such. You should plan with the purpose what your interview is going to be about and exactly what you're gonna do. You should establish a rapport with your patient, and this um, is what helps you gain trust with your patient. It will make them feel that you're trustworthy and that you're reliable and that you uh, respect them. You should always introduce yourself to your patients first, and then anytime you're addressing your patient, you must address them with their surname unless they have um, told you otherwise. Um, eliminate distractions when you're in there and the nurse should always be in control of the interview and ask questions until the end of the interview and then after that you want to then uh, pose questions or let the patient ask you questions or state any concerns that they may have there will be a lot of questions that you will have to gather the data and um, first such as what medications you're on and take time to go through all of those medications are herbal supplements. And then another thing that goes on during the communication process is sometimes you're going to have to appear unscathed because some patients will be embarrassed by some of the um, questions you ask, like when was your last bowel movement or a question that could suggest, um, um, are you still sexually active? Those kind of things. Close-ended questions will be time savers for you. Then open-ended questions uh, about things like, um, so what brought you here to the hospital today? Those should come last to give them time to elaborate on those questions. Now, let's talk about within the communication process. You have verbal communication and nonverbal communication. You also have communications by means of gestures, body postures, intonation, general appearance, and body language. Now, when we're talking about nonverbal, this shows more what a person is thinking and feeling. Nurses must watch for nonverbal cues with their patients. Verbal and nonverbal messages may be in conflict with each other, but please make note that they should coincide with each other. And when I say they conflict, what I'm basically saying is, is for example, you have a patient that's grabbing and holding their arm and seem very rigid um, every time you go to touch them. And then you say, are you having any pain? And their answer to you is no. That's where I mean when I say that the two messages conflict. Nonverbal language communicates just as much as verbal ones do. No, uh, observations of your patient and yourself with nonverbal communication is very important. Now, when I say and yourself, what I'm saying is, is when you are communicating uh, with your patients, if you have your arms crossed or if you are blankly staring at them, that is showing a nonverbal cue that you should not be intending. Now, please write this down, highlight it. If a patient uh, was to write an answer to one of your questions when during your interview. Is this considered nonverbal communication 
our verbal communication. Now, the answer to that question is it is, is, it is verbal communication. Now, let's talk about some nonverbal language. You should use cues to nonverbal expressions. You should look for those such as grimacing when touched, uh, rigid body posture, slow movement, or holding or guarding a body part. That can mean pain. Now, picking at bed covers or doing a lot of constant hand movements um, and also restlessness can mean anxiety. Uh, staring, um, at a person or tight jawline muscles, clenching of the teeth or clenching of the fists can indicate anger. And we must watch for that as well. Now, we always ask for confirmation of what you are seeing, because sometimes, believe it or not, what we're seeing is not what was meant to come across um, from the patient. Now, touch is also another one that can convey acceptance, sympathy, and support along with caring. Please make a note of that. Um, an example of that is, is if you have a patient um, that you're viewing things with, uh, you can lightly, um, you know, place your arm on their shoulder and say something as, uh, you seem very nervous. Can you tell me about it? Can you, do you want to talk about what's going on? When you do that, that is showing them that you care. And they may open up and want to express to you what's going on. Verbal and nonverbal language should match. Please make a note of that. Verbal and nonverbal language should uh, match. And it should be consistent. Such as teeth clenching. And then you ask the patient, do you have pain? And they say, yes. Then that's showing you that those two things match. Verbal communication include talking, writing on a paper or a blackboard or a whiteboard, and written instructions. Now let's talk a little bit about factors affecting communication. So factors that can affect communication our culture, past experiences, emotions and or mood, attitude of the individual, self-concept, and physical problems. Now note and highlight, make, make some kind of a stars or whatever around it. Building a rapport with patients may take time. You need to respect the individuality of the patient and act in a reliable and trustworthy manner. Hold on a second, guys. My dog is barking. Okay. So when I state culture, I talk about culture aspects and I always like to let this part be known. When I'm talking about cultural aspects, I am not saying that this goes for every culture, every time, or every person within the particular culture. I'm just basically stating that there has been a study that have shown this factor or, you know, this is what they may normally see when we're talking about this culture. So with cultural aspects, I'm talking about things like personal space, eye contact, like averting the eyes um, in some cultures. Meaning of the word yes may not mean yes. Uh, cultural norms, like older adults may not want to take instructions from younger people. Or religious beliefs. Now let's dive into the cultural differences just a little bit. Uh, for cultural differences, uh, they may require different personal space. For example, Americans are very comfortable with 18 inches to four feet and average personal space, 
But now with Corona, we're all talking about six feet, honey. Social distancing is different for some cultures. So, like I said, not all. Okay, I'm just telling you the little study. Native Americans, North uh, Europeans, or and Asians maintain more distance from other um, cultures. Other than like most of America, um, Hispanic, you know, Middle Eastern. Most Americans expect direct eye contact. But some cultures believe that it is rude to maintain direct contact with someone that you do not know or someone that you are not close friends with. In some Asian cultures, it is considered inappropriate for women to look at or speak directly to men that are not uh, in their friend circle or in their family. Eye contact is very important in communication. Be careful, though, of some cultures. Uh, Japanese, Chinese, Vietnamese, things like that, they do not really want to maintain eye contact. It does not mean that they're being abused or anything like that. They consider it rude to look at someone directly in the eyes. The best thing to do is to follow the patient's cues. Please make a note of this, highlight it, draw circles. Remember, if someone from a different culture were to back up from you, it could be differences in culture and their need for personal space. If they are backing up from you, that doesn't mean that you keep walking towards them. Now let's talk about past experiences with communication. How we perceive what is communicated to us depends on several things. It depends on cultural values, level of education, occupation, previous life experiences, or familiarity with the topic. For example, um, a patient who may be more educated may understand some medical terminology that you are trying to throw at them. Um, and some persons who may not be as educated may feel that you're attempting to speak over their head uh, when you're using medical uh, terminology. Now let's talk about emotions and moods. Moods can alter both sending and receiving of messages. As a nurse, you have to go to work and you have to have good bedside manner, even if you are not in such of a good mood that day. You are not able to decide to just have, um, bring whatever's angering you from home to work. That doesn't work out for you in the field of nursing. An anxious person may interpret a message differently from the meaning of the sender. An angry sender may send a message that is misinterpreted by a calm receiver. None um, of this helps communication when they're mismatched like that. A tone of voice may be loud and more abrupt, and that may give the appearance of an angry sender. A depend, uh, depressed person may speak very little and be withdrawn. So a person's attitude affects how a message is going to be received. Now let's talk about attitudes. The attitude affects how a message is worded. Accompanying body language may amplify a message or confuse the receiver if the two are incongruent, so if the two do not match. Nurses should try to maintain a non-judgmental attitude and open posture when communicating with the patient. When I say open posture, I mean like um, facing the patient. I also mean like with your arms open, not crossed. If you have an accepting attitude, you give an impression that you care and that you're trying to understand what the person is trying to say to you. Patients often say things that may seem very rude to you when they are upset or scared. It does not mean that you come back to them with the same kind of energy. Communication skills um, deem a lot of active listening. Active listening requires concentration and focused energy. It uses all the senses to interpret both verbal and nonverbal messages, which we call feedback. 
listens for feelings as well as words. It maintains eye contact without staring and making a conscious effort to block out distractions. Please make a note of this. Provide nonverbal clues for your patient. Make it easy for them to know that you're communicating well. Do things like lean forward in your chair, looking at their face when they're speaking, nodding in agreement, and keeping an open body posture. Um, facing patient, arms not crossed. If their arms are crossed, that's closed. Speaking slowly and distinctively to the patient is the correct way to get information from the patient. You can ask for the patient uh, permission if you can speak to someone in their room, like a family member or a friend to get information if they are struggling with things like if they've had a stroke, if they have shortness of breath, things like that. But if you um, are going to speak to the family members after they give you permission to do so, you still must direct the questions to the patient. Do not ignore the patient or talk around them at all. Now let's talk about interpreting nonverbal feedback. Observe for the posture, the gesture, the uh, tone, facial expressions, smiling, frowning, and eye contact. For your feedback, it is important, it's an important part of effective communication. It verifies that the message was received the way that you intended to send it. It accomplishes um, a lot of things. You can paraphrase or restate the message to make sure that it is received. Now let's talk about focusing. Focusing is communication, um, a communication, um, uh, a way to kind of understand if the communication is getting where you need it to go. The communication may wander. That's one example from the main topic that you intended and you need to focus the concentration back. Good communicate communicators can refocus the conversation by returning to the topic of the discussion without uh, the patient even missing a beat. Frequent feedback is also what we need to do to keep the conversation focused. Don't be afraid to say, I think we need to talk about Blah, 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 Mr. Smith. But as soon as we're done talking about blah, 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 we could talk about this other matter that you really want to talk to me about because I really want to hear it. Now let's talk about adjusting styles. Communication should be adjusted to the patient's style and the patient's speed. If the patient communicates slowly, allow them more time to interpret and respond to what you're saying. For an anxious patient, keep the information simple and convey only as much information as a time as you need to because we do not want to overwhelm them. Now let's move on and talk about therapeutic communication techniques. There are several and I'm going to name them, but then there's a few that I really want to spend a little time on. We have promoting communication between sender and receiver, obtaining feedback, Focusing on the communicator, using silence, using open-ended questions, restating a message, and using therapeutic touch and clarifying. Now, please make note of Table 8-1 for communication uh, therapeutic techniques. You must know that. You must know that chart. Now, let's talk about clarifying just a little bit. With clarifying, you are telling the patient what your perception of what they are saying is. For example, the patient may say, my daughter hasn't come to see me in a week. And the patient may have a very disappointed look on their face as well. You should clarify this by saying, so you're upset that your patient hasn't come to see you in a week? And she may then say, no, I'm just worried that she is not being taken care of. Now, by you doing that simple clarification, 
you have figured out that she was not disappointed. She was worried. Then you could help the patient find reassurance that their daughter is being taken care of. And now you can help them with that worry. Now let's talk about restating. Restating the message encourages the patient to continue on with the topic. If the patient states, I'm not hungry. The nurse repeats, you're not hungry right now. That is restating. The patient may say to you, no, I'm just not hungry. Or they may say, no, I just don't want to eat right now. There's two whole different things. If they say, no, I'm just not hungry, you might want to see what's going on with their appetite. If they just say, oh, well, no, I'm just not hungry right now, then you know they will eat, but they will eat later. Touch indicates caring and therapeutic for most patients. Okay, and when we talk about general leads, general leads are questions that cannot be answered with yes or no answers. For example, if I say to Miss Smith, hey, Miss Smith, how are you doing today? Tell me how your day went yesterday since I didn't see you. That's an open-ended question and gives her a chance to elaborate. Another thing that we do is offering self to the patient and being available will create a trusting relationship between you and your patient. Do not make any promises that you cannot keep. For example, we do not say things like, I will be back in 30 minutes and then don't return in 30 minutes. You never know what could happen. Now let's talk about silence. Silence is something that it's hard for nurses to understand that's very needed to do. Because we're nurses, right? We want to fix it. We want to figure it out. We want to fix it. But silence sometimes is what patients need. It gives the person a chance to think and respond when we're being silent. We're thinking before we respond. And often it's the best response when someone is upset and crying. They sometimes just need someone to sit there and to be silent and to listen. Now let's talk about therapeutic communication techniques. Like giving general leads, giving information, encouraging um, elaboration, and looking at alternatives and summarizing. Offering self and encouraging elaboration is super important to therapeutic communication. Now we're gonna flip it and talk about roadblocks for effective communication. Now, please note in the book, there's a section that says blocks to effective communication. Please read that. Please know them and know the difference between them. Now let's talk about one roadblock that um, is changing the subject. This indicates discomfort with the subject at hand. It also shows that you are avoiding listening to the patient's concern. What this says to the patient is that you don't have time to listen to their story. And we don't want to convey that. Another block is offering false assurance. Saying things like, oh, it'll be okay. Don't worry about it. You must be realistic and not false. Even though you want everything for them to be okay and for them to not worry about it. You say that to make them feel better, but then you've given them some false thought. Another block is giving advice. Giving advice focuses on you rather than the patient. And we're there for the patient. It's not about you. You can give the patient options to choose from, and it doesn't sound much like advice. For example, if a patient is having a hardship and they're discussing something that you may feel like they, need, they may need counseling for, there's a way to make it sound like you are giving advice and a way to make it sound like you are giving them an option. To give them an option would say, maybe have you considered therapy? Giving advice would be, I think you need therapy. Okay, there's a difference. Sorry. 
uh, defensive comments. Our role is to help the patient to not, um, our role is to help the patient, but to not make them defensive. We must acknowledge their feelings and listen to their concerns. An example of this is if you have a patient that says, you're late. You said you'd be here in 30 minutes and you did not come. It is not your goal to return that same. It is your goal to diffuse that. You would say, you seem upset, Mr. Smith. Do you want to talk about it or is there something I can get for you right now? You would not appear uh, defensive by saying, well, Mr. Smith, I'm sorry, but our unit is very busy and I was busy doing other things for other patients. That right there is not very therapeutic and it is defensive. Now let's talk about a few others like uh, prying or uh, probing. Now, I see this done sometime when we're when you're not even interviewing anymore. Now you're just probing. Now you're just being nosy. If you say to a patient, um, and, and by the way, this can make a patient very defensive. When you say to a patient something like, well, how much money do you make? That has nothing to do with your care for that patient at all. Or if a patient comes to the hospital because they're injured, and you say to the patient, well, why were you doing that? Did you not know that you were going to get hurt? That's prying and probing. Another one that's a block in communication is using cliches. Cliches are so overused. I use cliches when I'm talking to people, but I never use cliches when I'm talking to patients. And when I say cliches, I mean you're saying things um, that have no... Uh, validness to the situation like there will be a light at the end of the tunnel what is that gonna do or if you say well you gotta see the rainbow behind the clouds that doesn't help your patient at all now let's talk about inattentive listening Interpreting or finishing a sentence for the patient is inattentive listening. Sometimes this is very hard when you're very busy and someone wants to talk. Uh, it's very hard, but you must concentrate on that. Now, um, let me see. Yeah. So let's talk about challenges for nursing. Um, developing interviewing skills are, can be challenging. Using the nurse-patient relationship, using empathy, becoming non-judgmental, maintaining hope, applying the nursing process, are dealing with impaired patients, children, and people from other cultures. Now, let's talk about it just a tiny bit. The nursing-patient relationship it's something that you will get better at as you do it. It focuses on the patient, acceptance and non-judgmental. It has goals. It's defined by boundaries. And it takes place in the healthcare setting. And it ends with discharge. Please make note that social relationships last until the two people decide to end it. Boundaries are defined by the patient's problems, the help needed, and the nurse's professional role. Now let's talk about application of the nursing process, applying it. Assessment is what language is spoken. You must assess that. If it is English language, is it understood? The patient may need an interpreter. What is the patient's vocabulary level? What is their education level? You want to understand and know if the patient has a neurological impairment present. Do they have aphasia, which is difficulty um, expressing or understanding 
language. Uh, they may need to get a speech therapy if they have um, aphasia, often accompanied by a stroke. Normally we see that. We need to know what culture factors may affect communication, like personal space needed. We also want to know, can the patient speak? Can they read? Can they write? These things are very important for us to know and pay attention to. Now let's talk about communications with hearing impaired patients. We must speak distinctively. We do not shout at them. Okay? Speak slowly. Give the person time um, to see what's going on or hear you. Give them attention. Maintain a good distance uh, to them so that they can hear you appropriately. Watch them for non-verbal feedback. Watch their facial expressions or any other signs. And you will use short sentences and paraphrase for clarification. So when you are communicating with hearing impaired, you need to also know, does the patient have hearing aids? Are they wearing the hearing aids? Is a volume turned on? When we are speaking slowly, we want to make sure that we are facing the patient and give the patient time to respond. And we also will use frequent feedback. We're going to use simple, short sentences and give the patient time to respond. Sometimes you have to rephrase something in a way to make the patient understand it just a little bit better. Now let's move on to communicating with the elderly. When we're communicating with the elderly, we want to limit outside distraction and make sure that the patient, um, uh, make sure that you have their attention. Do not mistake nodding of the head as agreement because that might not mean agreement. Please make a note of this. Highlight it, make stars. Communicating with the elderly, you want to speak slowly and give them time to process what was said. Please make note. Communicating with the elderly, speak slowly and give them time to process what was said. Another thing when we're communicating with the elderly is to try to introduce ideas one at a time. Do not overload them with all the information because they may become overwhelmed and then cannot decipher what you were saying. Now, communicating with children, you want to approach them at eye level. Use a calm and friendly voice. Keep the mother in the room when possible. Use short sentences. Give examples or explanations or even demonstrate. Allow the child to handle all equipment that is safe for them to handle. When communicating, we say get down to eye level because it can be very overwhelming when somebody so big is towering above them um, and it could make them feel fearful. Avoid sudden movements because they're really watching you because they don't know what's going to happen. Children are very sensitive to nonverbal messages. When you're communicating with an infant, try to keep the mother right in view for that baby to see her. For toddlers and preschoolers, use short, simple sentences and concrete explanation. For school age children, short and simple explanations and also allow the child to handle equipment that is safe for them to handle. Always be honest and tell the truth. We never tell a child a tale like, oh, it's time to take your candy. That's how overdoses happen with meds because then someone has told them that it was candy. Um, and then we never say that a procedure is not going to hurt. Um, this won't hurt. Then every time somebody comes in to do a procedure, even if it's something that's not going to hurt, they're going to be fearful of it. So you must be honest. If you're going to give them a shot, be honest. Say, okay, this is going to pinch for a bit, but it'll be over really soon. Be honest. Now let's talk about communication with people from other cultures. Some cultures, it is proper to address all questions to the male authority figure in their life. That does not necessarily mean that they are being abused. You just need to know what cultures you're dealing with. You must determine what language they're spoken in their culture. 
Obtain an interpreter if necessary. Enlist the aid of a family member if appropriate. Now that's a very sticky situation right there. There is language lines that will cover all languages, okay? Because sometimes when we ask the family members to, um, to interpret for us, sometimes they don't understand the medical terminology that you're saying and they could say something that's different. Or they're wanting to shield the patient from something so they're not saying everything that you've said. So in an emergency situation, it may be okay to use a family or friend member of their family in order to communicate, to be their interpreter, but you must really work on getting that language line. It's the most effective. Give printed material if available and answer any and all questions. Be aware of cultural differences such as eye contact and personal distances. Now, communicating with your healthcare team, we communicate back and forth all the time. And we communicate with things like the nurse's notes, the physician orders, OT, which is occupational therapy, PT, which is physical therapy, RT, which is respiratory therapy, and, spirit and speech therapy notes dietitian notes, radiology and laboratory findings, and end of shift report. Communication with your healthcare team is very important. The patient's chart is used, pharmacy orders are used, com uh, computer communications for transmitting requests for dietary services, for central service supplies, drug orders, Respiratory therapy, physical therapy, like OTPT, all of those, those are communicated through computer. When delegating, make sure that you give precise instructions and listen clearly to the feedback. Now I'm going to demonstrate uh, one way of communicating with uh, someone on your care team that you're trying to delegate something to and the best way to do it. Now, one way to do it that is not very good for you, the nurse, is if you say, um, go down to room 101 and take Mr. Smith's blood pressure. If it's high, you need to come back and let me know. Well, that aide may not know what you are considering high or not, okay? So if you say to that aide, um, go down the hall to Mr. Smith's room. Take his blood pressure. And if it's 150 over 80 or higher, I need you to come tell me right away. Now you've given direct instructions and they will come back with that reading if it's outside of the parameters for you. I need you to know the difference. Now the ability to use a computer is essential in today's healthcare system. Long gone are the days of just pen and paper. Computerized records for patients are everywhere. You should never share your password. Never let a, a person put something in a chart under your password. And log out every time you leave your computer. And always have your screen covered so passerbyers cannot see it. Now, let's talk about telephoning a physician. I always tell a little story here um, about the first time that I had to call in report to a physician. It was very scary in my nursing career. And it was with Dr. Ballinger at Touche Regional Hospital. I will never forget it as long as I live. So I'm calling him to give report. I don't have nothing narrated on what I'm going to say. I just have the chart. And I am giving him telephone report. I am telling him Pertinent information, information he don't care about, information about what happened last week and, and why she's there today. Child, I was just going on and on. Finally, he said, who is this on the phone? And I told him. And he said, uh, get off this phone. I'm coming up there. Because I don't know what you're trying to tell me. I don't know what's going on. I'm coming up there. Oh, my gosh, y'all. I was so terrified. I was brand new. I was a baby nurse. He comes up there and I am mortified because he is raising his voice. He is saying, 
You need to know what's pertinent information. You never just ramble to me. You need to understand what's going on. And I could just feel myself just getting smaller and smaller in my head. So finally, after he was done with his rant, he says to me, this is later on in the, in the shift, after I'm like, can almost find a corner to crawl in. He says, you need to understand, you are the nurse. You are my eyes and you are my ears. I don't know anything other than what you tell me. You are the one who make me move. He told me that. He told me that. He says, nurses are what make us move. Because if you are my eyes and ears, you have to tell me what's going on so that I can act. And that's a true statement. I learned then how to give report and how to make my narrative in what we call now the SBAR report. When you are calling a patient, I mean, when you're calling a physician about a patient, you need to have current patient data on hand, including current vital signs, pertinent laboratory data, um, any, you know, outputs or things like that, that you feel are pertinent at that particular moment and what medications you've already given the patient. And in fact, you are asking for another medication to be given. You must make sure that you have looked over that chart. You have looked over those meds so that you know what you can already give without calling them about something that they have already addressed. Keep the chart handy and anticipate the information that your physician may request. You must know the patient's allergies and perform a quick assessment before calling that physician. Prepare a concise problem statement and the reasoning of why you are calling. Document the call and the physician's response in your nurse's notes. Please make note of this, highlight this. Student nurses should never ever, in the town of ever, take a telephone order or a verbal order from a doctor. If you are at one of our clinical experiences and a doctor walks up to you and tries to give you an order, you need to politely say, I'm so sorry, Dr. Washenhauer. Just made that name up. I'm a nursing student. I'm not allowed to take nursing orders, but I can get my instructor right now or I can get the charge nurse for you right now. That's who will take that order for you. You are to never, as a nursing student, ever take a telephone or a verbal order from a physician. You must always find your instructor or the primary nurse. Okay, now the last thing, those two things um, that we're going to talk about is the end of shift report. It's very important. It should be thorough. It should be summarized. Um, anything abnormal should be communicated. Any procedures that still need to be done should be communicated. Any problems with the family and the patient's mood need to be indicated. Please look at box 8-2 for what an end of shift report looks like. It is very important. And it's one of those things that when Ms. Williams say you need to know it, you need to know it. The SBAR uh, was um, kind of coined in 2008 under the National Patient Safety Goals, and it states that at the end of a shift, reports should be conducted in a standardized manner where caregivers have the opportunity to ask and respond to questions concerning patient care. The SBAR format is borrowed from the military communication guys, and it is used in some or most healthcare settings to date. S bar stands for this. S is for situation. B is for background. A is for assessment. And R is for recommendations. Now, end of shift should also have in the report the patient's whereabouts, their room number, their bed number, uh, what their name is, what their age is. Uh, is it a female? Is it a male? Uh, what date were they admitted? Uh, nursing diagnosis that they may have, and their physician's name. It should also include tests and treatments, therapies performed, or therapies that still need to be performed, and patient's response to any uh, therapies that have already taken place. Any significant changes in patient's conditions must be spoke about in the end of shift report, and scheduled tests 
or consent for uh, consent for surgeries that haven't been done. IV flow rates, what the solution is, if there are any additives in it, and any amount remaining in your bags so that they'll know if they need to hang one right away must be discussed in end of shift report. Current problems, abnormal lab findings, assistance needed with activities of daily living, which we call what? ADLs should be discussed in end of shift report. Any schedule and or needed PRN therapies need to be discussed. What medications were given last on your shift? What times were they given? And the patient's response to said meds. Concerns need to be um, discussed. Needs for order changes, needs for teaching, uh, needs for... Um, um, discussion about their pertinent family dynamics, and the patient's emotional status. Now, communicating in the home and community are a little bit different than communicating in um, a hospital setting. Um, when you are communicating while the patients in a home are in the community, you must give written detailed instructions whenever possible. Ask for uh, feedback to make sure all instructions were understood, especially when it's done on the telephone. Um, telephone orders or telephone instructions are given. We call those telephonic um, education or telephonic instructions. When A lot of time when we do telephonic instructions, it's followed up by those same instructions being mailed to the patient. Okay, and when we are um, in the home, we like to do a lot of handouts. Those help as well. Please make a note of this. Highlight it, draw arrows and stars. Communication on the phone is a little different. If an office nurse is teaching something over the phone, why do you think she asked the patient to repeat what she has said to them? And the reason for that is because the nurse wants to verify that the patient has understood exactly what they said, okay? So by asking them to restate, you're just basically asking them to clarify um, so that you know that they understood exactly what you said. So guys, that's the end of chapter eight, again. And I'm gonna attempt to upload it and you guys will be fabulous and you'll have everything that you need, okay? Bye.